Welcome to what we will call the bonus session. Once you've gone through all the previous videos, you probably want to get some more tips for the exams in this course. Well, if you actually do make the effort to follow my earlier advice, then studying for exams will be much less stressful. It will be more of a review session and it won't take too much time. You just need to focus on understanding the concepts at that point. Now, if you don't follow my advice, then, well, it happens. Sometimes you start out thinking you will do things properly, but life just gets in the way. It's fine. It's not the end of the world. You just need to make sure that you start preparing early enough. You have to give yourself enough time. Make up a study schedule for yourself and start making notes. Go through them and don't forget to take breaks. In fact, studies have shown that many short study sessions spread out over time are better than one long session. So you may want to consider using the Pomodoro technique that I talked about in an earlier video. Sleep could also be an important part of your breaks. Ideally, you should be sleeping for about eight hours a night, but studies have shown that even short naps can be helpful. The reason you need sleep is that our brains process information and integrate it into what we already know during sleep. This is called consolidation, and it happens while you sleep so that the process of encoding, i.e. what you do during the day as you study, does not interfere with consolidation. This means that effective studying involves taking time to sleep, while spending the whole night studying, i.e. what many students do, is very inefficient. When you finally have your exam paper in front of you, there are a few things to keep in mind. First, you don't have to start with the first question. Sometimes it can be a difficult one and this may make you lose your confidence. Secondly, flip through the exam and look for things you know you can answer quickly. This will help boost your confidence and make the exam less stressful. And thirdly, remember that you have a limited time to finish your exam. Don't spend too much time on a question. If you don't know the answer, then move on and come back to it later. Don't waste your time on the hard stuff until you've finished with all the easier questions. Remember, on a multiple choice exam, all questions are worth the same number of marks. Now, a quick warning about all this advice. If you're filling in your answers on an answer sheet right away, then make sure that you keep track of which question you're filling in and which one you have skipped. This will avoid problems later. Lastly, a few more general tips about common problems that students have with multiple choice exams. Please make sure you read the question carefully to make sure you know what it's asking for. Make sure you also read all the options carefully. Often students will rush and find the option that has some key word in it and choose it without really reading all the other options this may not be the right thing to do. If you also follow my advice that I've given you above, then you will have enough time, so don't rush. Take the time to read carefully. If you're not sure about the answer, then eliminate the options that you know are wrong before taking a guess. And be aware of absolutes like always or never. These are often included in the wrong answer. Now, Let's take a look at some sample questions, just to give you some idea of some of the types of questions you might be asked in this course. Keep in mind, I may not be giving away all the answers. Some questions are simply testing whether you've learned the definition of something. For example, this is simply testing to see whether you know what the word hydrophobic means. And here's a tip. Option A and B in this case mean essentially the same thing. It's very unlikely that the prof would have left two right answers for a question. So those are likely to be things that you can eliminate right away. Here's a longer question with two blanks. It's a little more challenging because you have to find the right combination of words to fill the blanks with. But it's still a fairly simple definition question. 
Some questions will ask you about things like the basic chemistry of biological molecules. For example, this one simply asks for the type of bonds you would find between nucleotides. And this one asks you to identify the appropriate polymer based on a given monomer. In all cases so far, these are very simple questions requiring only a simple memorized response. But some questions will ask you to check your knowledge and pull out the relevant information. For example, the nucleus is to eukaryotes as the blank is to prokaryotes. This is a fairly common way that comparison questions are constructed on multiple choice exams. Personally, I've always hated these as a student. They can be fairly confusing sometimes. In this case, we are asked to compare what we know about prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And specifically, it's asking for one similarity. If eukaryotes have a nucleus, then what do prokaryotes have? Now, clearly prokaryotes don't have a nucleus, so what we're looking for is a structure that is analogous to that. A structure that performs the same function in prokaryotes. Another way to ask you to make a comparison in your mind is to ask about differences. In this case, we're asking about differences between plant and animal cells. In both of these examples, you will have to go through what you remember about each type of cell in your mind. You will have to search through all the relevant information and then select the relevant piece of knowledge before you can answer. Profs tend to like comparison questions because they require a bit more processing than the simple recall or definition questions and thus are better indicators of learning. And since we are trying to assess your level of learning, we will sometimes also include a few more challenging questions. These are generally questions which will ask you to apply your knowledge to solve some sort of a problem. This is where just memorizing things will not help you too much. For example, this first question sounds like a simple math problem, but it requires you to know something about base pairing in DNA. To answer this correctly, you need to demonstrate that you know that adenine base pairs with thymine and thus there will also be 20% thymine. And that cytosine pairs with guanine and so the remaining 60% is divided equally between these two bases. In this last example, you are asked to look at an experiment and make conclusions based on the data you are provided. This may seem like a hard problem, but it really isn't. The key is to read it carefully. And again, this may be one of those questions that you skip at the beginning of the exam and come back to later. Now, let's take a closer look and break this question down. The first sentence tells us that cells are placed in a solution of glucose in which the concentration of glucose is gradually increased. So, Concentration is increased gradually over time. Now the second sentence tells us that the rate at which glucose enters the cells is found to increase as the concentration of glucose solution is also increased. So this means that the higher the glucose concentration on the outside of the cell, the faster it goes into the cell. I'm talking about rates here. The third sentence tells us that when glucose concentration of the solution is increased above 10 molar, the rate no longer increases. The key here is this last part. This does not mean that transport stops. No, it means that the cell takes up glucose, but at the same rate, no matter how much more glucose is added outside the cell. So the rate stays the same. So this means there is a limit to how fast it can be transported across the membrane. Once you know this, 
you can look at your options and try to figure out which one has that limitation and whether it's likely to be used for the transport of something as small and simple as glucose. And so concludes my very brief overview of exams. I hope this video has been helpful and I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. Also, I wish you the best of luck with your studying and with your exams. Thanks.